Welcome to episode 19. Oh, shoot, who's this? Ladies and gentlemen, Juggalos, Juggalettes, we have a very special guest with us today, a Juggalo icon, an independent wrestling legend. He's been with Psychopathic since the beginning. You've seen him in not one, but two games, Backyard Wrestling, Don't Try This at Home, Backyard Wrestling 2, There Goes the Neighborhood, the former JCW heavyweight champion, currently the host of Cruising the Barrio on crbradio.com, as well as Mover and Shaker extra, Extraordinaire for International Big Time Wrestling Homies. You know who we're talking about, none other than the king of hardcore himself, the Rude Boy on Hatch and Chat. Oh! Wow, man. I need you to follow me around and intro me and everything, man. Jesus Christ. That was cool. <laughs> Thanks Hell for yeah. having me. Guys, man, how's everybody doing? We're doing good, brother. And, you know, it's such an incredible honor to have you on this show. Thank you uh, for being our special guest here on this episode. And, uh, you know, before we start with some questions, we did want to shout out uh, International Big Time Wrestling because you guys got a very fresh event coming out at the time this airs. It's going to be tomorrow night on Christmas uh, Christmas Eve, right? Season's Beatings? That's right. Christmas Eve, Season's Beatings. It's our free preview, not pay-per-view. It's a free preview. And it, it, what it is is basically, look, we're in a crappy time with COVID and all that stuff, and we're locked up. And we decided for our company that we would put on a very special night right before Santa Claus comes and brings all the goodies. Kick back with your family and enjoy some wrestling. You know what I mean? It's a good time. And um, I got to tell you something. I'm really proud of what we're bringing out. This is our second special that we did. Um, we did a, a Thanksgiving special, the Turkey Day Tradition. And it was awesome. And uh, we're excited. It's, it's, it's on YouTube, so everyone can get it. And um, it's a nice long special, and uh, I think people will be pleasantly surprised on how good it is. Hell yeah, man. That sounds super fresh. And yeah, I believe that that's going to be on youtube.com forward slash rocks TV Detroit or just rocks dash TV.com. So yeah, uh, you know, we're going to talk a bit more about that event after, uh, but we're going to kick off some uh, questions because this episode is about Misery's EP, uh, Para La Isla. And Lars is going to kick it off with the first question for you, brother. So Rudy, what was it like to see psychopathic, um, go from just being a vehicle for ICP to signing Project Born, Misery, and Twisted. You were there from the beginning. Like, do you have any memories of what it was like to see them branch out and work with other artists? Well, one of the things that was cool about that time in our history was that um, we were willing to take chances. And we were willing to take chances on the other artists that we were working with. And we were willing to take chances. And we were willing to take chances. I remember being on tour with Twisted and... Uh, they were the House of Crazies at the time, and they were a trio. And um, they were on the, the great, uh, the great Malenko tour with us. And uh, you know, and it was really cool. I, 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 I really became good friends with them out there. And uh, we left the tour. We came back home, and then of course, um, we decided that you know we wanted to sign these guys. And they were like our very first big project. You know, of course we. We did Project Born, we did Misery, and it, but uh, you know, um, uh, the whole Misery thing was really something different. But the thing that I, I, I even to this day, even to this day, um, the only problems that I've ever had with these of the signings that we did was that we basically molded these artists into um, what we were doing. You know, I mean. Uh, uh, wearing makeup and, and doing the whole underground band and all that, you know, which is cool, you know. Everyone adapted to it, but there was that one standout who refused to do that. His name was Misery. <laughs> I always, I always stood up and said, Man, that cat is a real dude right there. Um, he's, a, he's a brother from the Bronx, a Puerto Rican brother from the Bronx, and um, let me tell you something. Uh, knowing Misery, getting to know him back then was like a culture shock for us. Because, you know, we're just some Midwestern boys from, you know, Southwest Detroit. And here was some hardcore homies from uh, the Bronx who didn't take no shit from nobody. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, he didn't take no shit from anyone. And, uh, uh, there, were, there were times that I've seen it with my own eyes where he would clash with the heads of psychopathic, i.e. Joe Bruce, you know, 
and uh, he was this uh, guy that, that brought um, some flavor to the hatchet that um, he didn't allow to be molded. He was misery, and that's who misery was, and that's who misery is today. And I'm proud to say that after all of these years, he's still a dear friend of mine. And uh, I, I talk to him all the time, and he's my boy. Man. I love him. Hell yeah, man. That's super cool. And, and that kind of leads into our, our next question. Like, do you have any standout memories uh, from when you, you know, you got to know Misery uh, or just any Misery stories from that era when you guys were making Para La Isla? Oh, uh, man, you know, uh, my, my Misery stories were not on tour, you know, because like um, back then we used to have, it. we used to be really nerdy, if you will. Um on our tours, we get a lot of drinking or smoking, or no, no weed smoking or drinking. And Misery was like, the hell with that, man. Misery was blowing weed and he was uh, uh, drinking Hennessy. And uh, uh, again, again, you know, he would, he would get into some trouble with, with the heads of the office, if you will. But um, uh, he was, like I said, man, in, in an effort. Whenever he felt threatened or like like disrespected, he was quick to tell you. And he was a kid, like I said, from the Bronx, New York, who never left the Bronx ever. And we took him on a nationwide tour. So he'd be in some hit towns and people would be staring at us. And he'd be the first guy to jump up and be like, hey, what you looking at? And they'd be like, dude, man, relax. Dude, just, he just, he's not used to seeing Cats fucking in with purple dreadlocks and stuff. <laughs> I mean, um, but uh, yeah, you know, those are some of the memories. And let me also say this: that again, when recording his album, um, he was a guy that stayed true to his roots and true to who he was. And uh, you can't do nothing but respect that. And uh, I, 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 I still to this day feel. Um, Feel that that record needed more attention than what it was given by the AR department, if you will, or the promotions people. Because I mean, look at right now how that rap is so hot and so big, and misery should be a household name. That's just my opinion. Hell yeah. Yes, so, and he was the first artist, Rudy, in, to rap bilingual, right? On Psychopathic to do Spanish and English that well, I can think of. I, Doing it proper, you know, he did a proper, you know, DJ Clay came and did some Spanish, but um, misery, yeah, he did. And again, you know, um, my, my whole thing was back then was, um, and, and again, you know, I, I don't know, this might get me in trouble. I ain't getting me in trouble because I don't give a shit. But um, <laughs> the thing is, is that I used to tell Alex. What are we doing? Why are we pushing this to the juggles? The juggles are going to buy it. The juggles already are, are down with misery. Let's take this to the streets. Let's take it to the, the Latin community. Let's take it to you know uh, places where we you know waters we never swam in. And um, by whatever, Alex just didn't feel like it was right, or he was um, to be honest afraid of treading in those, in those waters, you know, and, and giving it a chance like that. And, um, uh, so I feel as though, you know, like, um, you know, if we would have given it the proper, um, the proper send off and the proper, um, how do you say it, the proper uh, nourishment. It, 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 the nourishment needed to be done right in a different way. Like I said, you know, the Juggalos loved it already. When we took them on tour, man, every night they would turn it out. And uh, so they, they were going to get the record regardless. So why not broaden our horizons? And unfortunately, nobody broadened those horizons. And, and, and that, that also made me clash with certain people, too. Because, you know, like uh, when, you, when you're helping on projects like these, you want to see it strive. You want to see it do the best it can do. And, um, uh, you know, do it with, you know, real conviction, you know. And uh, I don't know, like I, like I said, you know, um, misery, again, should be a household name just as much as Pitbull is. And I mean that, you know. Do you know, Rudy, do you know, remember how many they sound scanned? Like how many units he sold of that? 
I, I don't remember. I know, like, um, I remember it was low. It was low, but it was average for a uh, job artist. I mean, he sold as much as uh, uh, ABK and uh, uh, Project Bar at the time, you know. Um, so it wasn't like, uh, again, again, um, maybe by chance because we didn't know how to um, to promote to certain genres, you know. But we also didn't take a chance and try either. That's cool. Thank you. That's some good, that's some really good primary source, like background. Um, my question was how the jugglers reacted, but it sounds like they were feeling it. Um, and that, and no, that the, like. The jugglers were real uh, uh, receptive to it. And uh, they, they, you know, it's weird, you know, because for me personally, I was like, I don't know if it's going to work. You know, I, I, I don't know, you know, for the jugglers and, and the jugglers, like I said, gravitated to it also. And then it was like, all right, now what are we going to do? Now let's go out there and let's see what the rest of the world. Because you know, um, you know, it, it, you know, every artist, even underground artists today, still suck on that same kit to try to get what's left of it of the, the psychopathic era. You know, and and I'm not saying that they can see it or anything like that, but. We were the we were the innovators, you know, and and to this day, when when artists come up to me and they say, "Hey, Rudy, man, you gotta listen to this," and the first thing they do is they hand me their CD and they've got makeup on, and I I, I I'm not even kidding, man. I simply hand it back to them and say, "That bring me that when your shit's original, because there's already ICP, there's already twisted. Let's see who you are." Right. right as an artist you see what i'm saying hell yeah absolutely and and that's what he was his own artist and to this mm -hmm. day still is for sure Absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, you know, my next question, you did kind of cover it uh, a little bit. Um, you know, we, uh, we know that things initially didn't work out between misery and psychopathic after the initial signing, we only seen mm -hmm. the one EP uh, and juggalos were feeling it. And luckily we got a 20th anniversary, you know, many years later with the demon angel LP as well. Um, and he's a juggalo fixture to this day, as is the rest of Spanish side. But can you tell us a little bit more as far as like when you guys knew it was over, as far as misery and psychopathic going their own ways uh, in the late 90s? Like, how did that kind of uh, pan out? You know, once again, it was just, it was a business. You know, yeah. Bob Bruce, uh, Job Steady is one of the um, uh, brother in law with, with misery. And, um, so, of course, he had a personal stake in, in the whole thing. But the rest of the company seen the numbers. And again, you know, I, I'm one of the guys that was in the company that said, you know, you know, the numbers don't necessarily tell the story when it comes to an artist like this. Right. Again, if we would have given it some, you know, some, some, another platform, to showcase this, I think it would have done better. However, I do remember the day when, when every, everything went down. And it was a sad day, and it was a sour day, and misery was really, really salty, you know. And misery, you know, publicly went out and dissed the hatchet. And, I mean, it's all, you know, there's no, uh, it's not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling any, you know, I'm not dropping any bombs. No, right. But, um, you know, and, and that sucked too because. Again, you know, he's still my friend, you know, and, and you know, and, and there were times where I'd ask him, man, why am I doing that? And again, he was salty, and you know, he felt as though he wasn't treated right, he felt as though his record wasn't um, uh, nurtured right, and it wasn't uh, presented to the world the way it should have been. And, you know, for, you know, I had to admit that I agree with him. Word. Absolutely. And I think we agree that, uh, you know, it could have done something on a major hip hop scale if it was promoted to a, a general hip hop audience, because that album is just so good. Agreed. Agreed. You know, I, I tell this to this day, I'm like, you know, when he puts on records, you know, and again, he knows to go straight to the general source. And I say, misery, man, bro. Take this on another level and get out there with J. Cole and open some shows for that guy. 
get out there and you know uh, get your get your name out to the world where they don't know who the hell you are. Right. Everyone knows who you are here. Yeah. yeah. Strive to the top, and you know I, I also want to say this about misery is that um, misery lacks management. You know. And, and um, management that can handle misery <laughs> in the whole uh, Spanish side camp. <laughs> Those guys are some, they're some, they're some characters. I love it. every one of them. They're my favorite people in the world to party with, man. But this is what I love. <laughs> That's what's up. Um, it's we talk about on the episode, Rudy. We filmed before about how coming out in the post Jiggy era in New York, he was groundbreaking in that kind of keep the gangster style with the Puerto Rican vibe and and being able to do songs like Witching Hour and how that was really unique and bridged these worlds. And you're right, he was an artist who was ahead of his time, and that's so much about timing with the music industry and like it's really interesting to to hear your background on that so thank you for for thank you for that info it's tight to talk to you about he still goes back because it's true love you know and uh, you know he's got his boy you know uh Fuego Flames out there doing the damn thing i don't know if you heard his new record Hell but yeah. it's hot it's so hot man. i'm glad we, we played our Chris in the barrio and you know we, we're primarily like an old school show but when we played it, everyone was like, whoa, what is this? Man, what is this? And, um, you know, the, the, that whole camp, man, they, they're, they're all on hip hop, man. You gotta, you gotta respect that, you know? Yeah. Um, we, uh, that's, we wanted to know, do you know, was Misery born in the seventies? Like where, like, cause hip hop coming out of the Bronx, he must've been there when Cool Herc and Bombada and them were first getting their start. Like, do you know how old he is or is that secret? I, I, don't, I don't really know how old he is. I know he ain't no spring chicken, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. But I'll tell you what, he used to tell us stories of running into guys like Cool Herc and stuff and, you know, at, at different clubs and everything. And, you know, I'd be on the bus, on the tour bus, you know, like, oh, man, you know, tell me about blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, man, that cat, he wasn't shit and all that. <laughs> You know, Fat Joe was my man. You know, he always took us up with weed and stuff, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so he, so he's been around. And again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's well over twenty. Right. <laughs> That's what's up. Um, well, we want to talk about the show. Um, Seasons of Beatings. Before yeah. we go any further, well, I'm so happy. I've been doing all of these promotional uh, interviews. Carly has been setting them up for me. And I just want to thank you guys for not asking me, how did you fall in love with wrestling? Where did you learn how to wrestle? What's your favorite wrestling? I mean, God, oh my, I just answered that a million times in the last three days. <laughs> oh my God, shit. And then when you guys are coming at me like this, I'm like, oh, what a breath of fresh air. And it's catching me off guard, to be quite honest. <laughs> Lord, man, we're glad that we could give you a unique interview. We want to talk, well, this is some wrestling stuff, but it's about the, the match. What are some of the matches we can look forward to at Seasons Beatings that you can tell us that's that's not, like, secret? Seasons Beatings, there ain't no secret, man. It's, you know, international beats are wrestling. How you know how we started this? And, um, you know, we wanted to give an alternative to what's on television. You know, we wanted to maybe give it a throwback feel to when you would watch wrestling when it was in a studio at 6.05. TBS and uh, all of that cool stuff. And um, we, we were presenting wrestling kind of the way it used to be, like uh, good versus evil, you know, and uh, not a bunch of flips and flops and all that stuff and people trying to uh, do high spots over and over and over. It's actually telling a story and um, also allowing families to watch it. But they're not embarrassed by, oh, shit, I can't let my kids see that. Or, oh, did they just say that? Oh, you know, no, it's just a, it's just a family promotion. It really is. And it's something that um that lacks in the world of wrestling. I've, I've been in wrestling for 30 years now. I'm celebrating 30 years this year. And, um, and that's weird because I'm 28 years old. Man. <laughs> but, but no, anyways, um, uh, we, uh, we, we, we put this together many years ago, and we've been running shows, and no one knew it was my show. No one did. And they were successful, and people were going out to them and 
So then we hooked up with the boys at Rock TV, and they said, man, let's do some TV, let's do this. So one of the cool things is, starting in February, we have a, an actual television show. It's called International Big Time Wrestling, The Power Hour, and it's going to be on Amazon Prime every week. So oh, there. that's right. Amazon Prime scene, the content that we had, they were like, oh, hell yeah, we'll do this, we'll do this. Of course, when they see my name was attached to it, they were like, oh, no, it's going to be broken glass and thumbtacks. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's, it's totally not that. And uh, some of the matches that we have on season's meetings include um, all the Madman Pongo from JCW, one of the wildest men in all of wrestling. And he's going for the International Big Time Wrestling World Championship against the nation's very own and world champion, the one and only Kadeem Zayn Mohammed. Now, if, uh, you guys don't know that name at all. But let me tell you something. When you see this guy wrestling, You'll, you'll be asking yourself, why the hell isn't this guy on AEW or WWE? I mean, he's really that good. And I'm not co-signing him just because he's my champion. I'm co-signing him because he's the shit. And then, of course, we've got the, the hottest independent wrestler in the world today, MM3, and he's going against Drake Jacobs. And this one is guaranteed to steal the show. It's, I'm really excited about it. I'm excited for the world to see it. I'm excited for you to see it. I'm excited for you guys to kick back and hit Carlito up next week and say, wow, man, where have these guys been? And, and again, we're just putting them on another platform. We have some other surprises that are going to go down on season's meetings, but I, you know, I got to tell you, it's something that I'm really, really proud of. Like I said, 20 years in wrestling, and uh, I've seen all the ups and downs in the business, and uh, I'm super proud that we're able to present something to families, like I said, during the pandemic where you're stuck in the house. And I urge you guys to go back right now and check out International Big Time Wrestling's The Fix on YouTube. And what we do is we just put matches out and we just let people get a feel for what we're doing. And they've been successful. They've been really successful. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be awesome. And then, of course, we have our Patreon coming right now. No, we no. get to do exclusive uh, um, content and backstage stuff and a ton of bloopers. And, you know, we're, we're, we're doing, like I said, we're doing some fun stuff. Um, the world doesn't always have to be so damn cynical. It doesn't have to be so damn shitty. You know, sometimes it can just be fun, man. You can just kick back and say, man, that was pretty fun watching that, man. You know, and, and you know, one of the things that I've done all of my life especially throughout the underground, is I've spread the most negativity in the world. And now I'm not that guy anymore. I'm the guy who, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who's spreading all kinds of positivity, man. Why? Because when I died back in 2016 after open heart surgery, died twice on that operating table, that was a change in my life for real. True story. And when I got out of that, he met Yes, I made a promise to myself that I was going to be a better man. And that meant going back to Juggalos. And I mean this. I had going back to Juggalos and saying, you know what, man, I, I want to apologize because I was the biggest asshole ever. Mm. I thought I thought I was I thought I was floating out of air, man. And the fact of the matter is, is I'm just like you and me. We're all the same. And please forgive me forever making you feel small because who the hell am I? I'm just Rudy Hill who bleeds just like you do. And maybe more frequently. Just like you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, doing cool things for people is, it makes you feel good. And, you know, again, I used to think that you know, being the superstar, you had to be the super asshole, and, and that wasn't me. And that's not me anymore. That was me. But and, and now I have juggles that came up to me at the gathering last year, and they were like, "Oh shit, really, man? I, dude, you, you you're so different than you used to be, you know, 20 years ago." Well, yeah, I've grown, and I like to think everyone has. You know, um, I still love to uh, kick ass and take names, but just like I did with Violent J at the gathering. 
That's what's up. Um, yo, um, I guess we, this, we're covering so much. We got two last questions and we'll be out and we're going to, um, we'll link to everything in the description snacks. You want to ask the second to last and then I'll finish it up. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about, you know, your, your ups and downs in wrestling or just the ups and downs of the wrestling business in general. You've, you know, you're, you're just hit, you're hitting 30 years in wrestling. I wanted to ask you an old school wrestling question. Uh, is international big time wrestling, is that name or the organization connected at all to the old Detroit territory, big time wrestling? Wow. I am a Merc. <laughs> uh, yes, it is, man. Um, you know, because we live we live so close to Windsor, Ontario, Canada, in right. Detroit. So we would get wrestling on uh, Friday nights at one in the morning, and it was called International Superstars of Wrestling. And then ah. we would get big time wrestling. So I just combined them both two of my favorite wrestling shows, and there you have it, international big time wrestling. Still matters. Hell yeah. Yo, that's good. Good, good trivia. This is some great trivia for the for the fans. That's Last so cool you do that, man. <laughs> that's so cool, man. I love it, man. There you go, psych psychopathic Mark, and then wrestling Mark. My wrestling knowledge is second to my psychopathic knowledge. <laughs> my, 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 my level just went sky high. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, last question: Who do you think is more skilled with a sharp object, misery? Or Abdullah the Butcher. <laughs> <laughs> or, or can you answer that even? <laughs> I guess I did. Um, you know, uh, Abdullah the Butcher is the sharp objects. Yeah. I've got the scars. That's right. <laughs> Oh yeah, man. That's what's up. Um, well, now the record has been set straight. We got all the history. We got the we got the trivia. And Rudy, I'd love to talk to you on the Lars podcast sometime, and we could get more into these stories. Talk more about how to how we can help promote your stuff. Connect you with the juggalos who watch our show who might you know just and the nerdcore kids and everyone in that world and we're always here if you need anything wait, 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 let me cut you off right now the way you guys conduct shit i would do anything for you guys i'm telling you that right now or... thanks homie that's that so nice lot. dude that Thank means you. a lot dude you guys, you guys are doing it right i love this i love this Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've been marked out. We're stoked to talk to you, man. It was cool. I remember meeting you at the, at the uh, Digi, uh, DGC con a few years ago. It was real cool to get to meet you. You're a humble guy, man. And it's a uh, stoke to have you on the show, man. And wish you happy holidays. And yeah, man, glad you're healthy and, and we love your positivity, positive karma. It's great to get that. man. So thank you for sharing with us. Yeah. I just want to tell you guys, thank you for allowing me to again, be here and, and taking the time out from your busy schedule to talk to an OG like me. And let me tell you something, man. You guys are the future. So just keep kicking that ass. And like I always tell everybody, man, we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. Be good to one another. Take care of one another. That's what we do. Hell yeah, man. Much What's clown up? love, Rudy. Whoop, whoop. Much love, Rudy. Thank Much you, brother. Talk soon. Whoop, whoop. Peace. Wow, Snacks, the rude boy himself on Hatchet Chat. 
Amazing, yep. dude. Wig blown back. Once again, I'm grateful for these bandanas because as soon as I take this off, the wig is coming off too. I mean, it's tight. I, now let's talk about we he talked about misery, but let's talk about um, how this fits into the canon of hip hop culture. So. My experience with the CD, I found Parla Isla at Newberry Comics in Cambridge. Um, I was on vacation with my family, and that that store is so dope because it has a lot of independent stuff that was hard to find. This would have been like shortly after it came out. I also found her like a King Missile record I always wanted to find, Way to the Salvation, which is in one of my favorite bands. Anyway, that same day I bought both these CDs. And when we're looking at the history of hip hop, this is a post Biggie era that's an alternative to like the jiggy era when i interviewed dj clay he put me on to the hip-hop evolution show on netflix which is so tight and he told me to watch it and i did and like it's a great episode on like the underground freestyling in washington square how like underground hip-hop in the late 90s in new york became this claim for cultural currency where alternative hip hop was rooted in hip hop, but kind of taking it back and Mayor Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani would, sh would send people to lock down the ciphers because having groups of people, especially people of color rapping seemed as like a threat. And so he did it as a way to bring in more tourists, but ironically hip hop was always such a big part of New York's history. But because he shut down the park with the quality of life laws, um, Danny Castro and Aunt Marshall started this thing called the Lyricist Lounge, which I'm sure a lot of the jugglers know about, which was like taking the park cipher to small clubs. And it kind of grew as this thing where like underground culture, freestyling, coming together, the ownership of hip hop returned to like its genesis. And when I was in college, I would, I had a radio, a hip hop show. I'd play underground hip hop. I'd have people come and cipher. Sometimes I'd have too many rappers that like couldn't even get on. Like I'd have a line of people trying to get in at, at Stanford, trying to get on my show. It's called Pandora's Beatbox, which I thought was a tight name. And it was ta about taking the underground and sharing the microphone and taking it away from, you know, Puff Daddy and the shiny suits era of hip hop, the Jiggy era, and taking it back. And as Taleb Quelly says in Hip Hop Evolution, quality is still profitable. And it would go all the way to Midwest. It would go to the Good Life Cafe in Los Angeles, where kind of like a lot of the Project Blowed and Living Legends and the underground um, hip hop on the West Coast. So it's, there's pride in not being mainstream. And I think that like Misery is interesting because we'll talk about Puerto Rican culture and hip hop. He believed that, you know, part of his stuff has an R&B element, part of it has a gangster element, but it does have more than other artists on Psychopathic have this kind of identity and um, message and vibe that I really fits with that fits with the Dark Carnival and a cool way to show that like hip hop can adapt to different situations. And it's a really special EP. So I wanted to talk about the background of like the New York culture that um, Misery came up out of and like why it made sense if you look at the, what happened right before. So let's talk about the background of the album's next. When did it drop? For sure. So uh, Paral Isla came out February 3rd, 1998. And, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of a background. At this point, Misery had actually uh, been one of the opening acts on ICP's uh, House of Horrors tour that they were doing to, to promote around the Malenko era. And, uh, uh, you know, many Juggalos know the story now. Uh, Misery was introduced uh, to Psychopathic through Jumpsteady, Violent J's brother, because um, uh, Jumpsteady's girlfriend, uh, later wife, uh, that's Misery's sister. So uh, that's how that connect happened. And again, you know, similar to the House of Crazies, they kind of formed a working relationship based off that tour. And, uh, you know, uh, less than a year later, you see in this EP. And that's why when when Rob was like, yo, you should put out my brother-in-law's record, Jay, it was fa a family already. And that's why when the stuff went down with um, Young Wicked and them, it was Misery's niece and, right. and Jay's niece and the stuff with Twisted. So that's like interesting. You hear the, Samantha rapping on, I think it's Forgotten Freshness 3, the family track, the bonus yep. track. And it's like you see that Jumps, Misery Nene is really family. Even though Jump Steady and Nancy didn't end up staying together, it goes deep. And that's like something really cool about how hip hop culture can bring you know, white kids from Southwest Detroit or the suburbs of Detroit into family with Puerto Rican gangster rap from new york um but but how it's the same vibe in the same family and i think that's something cool about hip-hop culture in general you know it unites us all um jay talks about how people felt like um 
Misery kind of looked like Tupac when he had his bandana. That he <laughs> represented a part of the hip hop culture that ICP couldn't really connect with because the Puerto Rican connection to old school rap goes so deep, and we'll talk more about that. So this EP came out Psychopathic Records. This would have been before, I guess, Twisted, right? Yeah. Because Twisted, and but it's interesting how he says Twisted so much on this record. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, and I wonder if like that stuck out for them and that's made them think of calling Twisted Twisted. Like, I think I can imagine three or four times he says it. Yeah, for sure. Know. It's very possible, know. you know, and yeah, like the the, the chronology can be kind of confusing when it comes to Misery and Twisted because I think like so much of it was happening at the same time. I mean, before uh, this EP came out, Juggalos would have seen the both Twisted and Misery in the Hocus Pocus uh, Headhunters music video. Uh, but yeah, for, we learned uh, from doing the Most Tasteless episode that this one seems to have come out before uh, Most Tasteless. So let's talk about um, the production on this. You did some good research, Snacks. Let's talk about who worked on this record. Yeah, for sure. So most of the tracks are actually done. Uh, the production credits are for uh, Misery, the uh, Minority, who we were actually wondering why Misery was shouting out so much, if he was a hype man or something. Um, and uh, one more pro producer, DJ P., uh, there were actually two uh, Mikey Clark tracks uh, on this as well, uh, Stack It Up and Witching Hour. But most of it, mm. uh, and you know, some, some incredible beats on this are, are made by that trio, Misery, DJP, and De Minority. That's what's up. So, he sh yeah, he shouted out De Minority on uh, Meat Cleaver, right? Is That's right, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Mikey Clark coming through, man. Mikey Clark clutch with the production. <laughs> I mean, wit Witching Hour was the first song I heard Misery on, on Forgotten Freshness, one and two, I guess. And then when I found the CD, I was like, it was, it was interesting to hear how most of the songs aren't like Witching Hour. Like, like right. we'll get into the song by song, but they have like that, the Puerto Rican horns, you know, like, like, like when we look at um, Latin influence in hip hop, it's very different when you look at like California, where I grew up speaking Spanish, was a Mexican American culture around San Francisco, the Bay Area. You go to New York, it's more of a Puerto Rican culture, especially in Brooklyn and parts of the Bronx. And Puerto Rican culture and hip hop goes deep. We can take it take it back to Lee Kionis, who was a graffiti artist who um, was friends with Fab Five Freddy, who would show his art in museums and he helped popularize the culture. DJ Charlie Chase worked with Cold Crush, which was one of the first underground groups. And then mainstream, we have Big Pun, Fat Joe, even J-Lo. And there's an interesting thing about the difference between, I'm gonna be delicate about talking about this because this is just what I've heard about in Mexican American hip hop culture versus Puerto Rican American hip hop culture, there's a license to say the N word in Puerto Rican hip hop, which you hear on this record because of the African blood that came through Puerto Rico, the slave trade that came through Puerto Rico to America. So there's this idea that there's an ownership of the word to take it back. But I've heard that there's controversy where you can't say that word if you're not Puerto Rican American. It's one of the only um, Latin cultures where you can say it. And that's why it's p big, big Punisher and Fat Joe get away with saying it. But when JLo dropped the N word, like she got canceled for that. People were like, yo, you can't say it. But she's like, I'm Puerto Rican American. We hear this on this record. And I feel like, you know, I I wouldn't say the word, but misery gets away with it where it's twisted. You know, we talked about it like it can. I don't know that it's just interesting to hear that in the context of that and how that goes back to the roots of the slave trade and American history and, and all that. So it's worth mentioning for why sure why that word's on here yeah absolutely and i'm looking forward to you know because you you schooled me off camera a couple of weeks ago about you know the puerto puerto, puerto rican involvement in hip-hop and things like that so that connection is wild and like you said it's just so culturally uh fascinating you know what i mean it's tight man i mean i lived in in williamsburg for years and um like my neighbors in upstairs from us were puerto rican american and like the music, like, it's really energetic and fun. The food is great. Like, our neighbors were super friendly. Like, I have a lot of love for Puerto Rican-American people I've met and and hung out with because they're just cool, friendly people. And I don't want to generalize, but, like, it's a very family-oriented culture. And, like, I feel honored to have lived in Puerto Rican New York. And he talks about the flag with the the star and the, and the lines. Like, he rhymes about it. And, like, you'd see that flag everywhere. And I think it's tight that, like, there's a part of – Williamsburg, right near the Hasidic Jewish area and the Puerto Rican area and the hipsters. Hipster Girl, which is um, some of you, anyone watching who might know some of my music, I talk about 
she uh, she lived by Union and by Grand Street. And Grand Street, when it crosses over in the Puerto Rican area, is called Bariquen Avenue. And Bariquen, this took me forever to learn, is the phonetic way of saying Puerto Rican. So if you call someone your Bariqua, that means your Puerto Rican homie. So I lived Which on Bariquen. Which you hear that word all over the ZP. Throughout the EP, for sure, and like that's it's it's interesting. Puerto Rican, Bariquen. You hear the you hear it and they spell it B O R I Q U E N, I think. And so that's confusing for people when they come to Williamsburg, Brooklyn, because they're like, okay, go down Grand. Wait, it's Bariquen. Well, that's just because it's got renamed. It got so anyway. I, it's cool. Right. It's fun to talk about this stuff. That Holland. is. That's so, so interesting. So only bilingual psychopathic records released. Like he has some songs where he talks about where he raps just in English, but some like um, Parla Isla where he is rapping in bilingual. So let's talk yeah. about that. Um, the title, of course, means for the island, Parla Isla, the island being Puerto Rico. We talk a lot about on the e episode with uh, about Most Tasteless. We talk about the fall of the empire. So after the um, Spanish-American War, um, uh, Puerto Rico became part of America. So any Puerto Rican person is an American citizen. That was starting in 1917. And it's interesting that Jay says on F the World, he goes, F all 52 states. And I wonder if that's a shout out to misery because some people might consider Puerto Rico a state. I don't know. Or he just got confused. I, I don't know. But that, I always thought about that. Wait, is he talking about Puerto Rico? Is he shouting out misery? I don't know. Violent J talk um in behind the paint he talks about how they tried to make misery stage show more interesting talk about that snacks because you did some good research on this for sure so yeah like uh violent j talks about how they kind of wanted to make the stage persona of misery a little bit more elaborate because juggalos are used to you know more theatrics of course because icp is super theatrical so they tried doing a couple of little things uh like that and one thing specifically that violent j mentions in behind the paint is they actually gave um like uh, they they started bringing out misery and poncho in like uh you know jail like garb like i guess the orange county jail um it, like uh jumpsuits by police officers so they were brought out uh, by police officers in handcuffs and stuff and then they rocked the show and then uh, they were scooped up by the police officers at the end as well, just to kind of give it a little bit of extra flavor. And Violent J did say that, it, you know, it kind of worked because I guess even though, you know, I don't I don't think that from what I understand, I don't think the misery reception was super poor, like as far as like Juggalo's not liking and stuff. But I guess it would have been a, a bit more traditional hip hop than they're probably used to going to ICP concert. So I, from, from what Violent J says, that kind of helped, you know, the Juggalos, uh, I guess, warm up to their stage show a little bit. Yeah. And there's this thing about later how Misery maybe didn't quite vibe with the the whole Dark Carnival thing and kind of went, tried to go off on his own. I met him. I remember we met him at the gathering. He was real cool. And he was like, yo, check out the Parla Isla re-release. He was like pr promoting that hard. And, you know, I feel like, like Project Born, it would have been interesting to see them incorporated more into the psychopathic, you know, community, like production line. But Twisted was an easier sell. The two spooky, tall, white dudes doing spooky ass raps like over <laughs> right. horrorcore beats. That was easier to sell. It's like, right. yeah, it's, it's like Simpsons doing Futurama versus Enchanted. That's a very obscure, like, <laughs> Enchanted didn't blow up as much because it's so different. That's a really strange comparison, but honestly, um, it's it's a, it's obscure comparison, but it, it's kind of accurate. Um, so at the end of of Shockumentary, Misery's going up to the sound guy, freestyling, or going up to uh, the director, Paul Andreessen, rapping, freestyling, and there's this joke always through ICP like jump steady leaving bad rap messages on the on the hotline like this joke like i want to be down with psychopathic let me freestyle so he's like pretending to pitch himself but i noticed something he doesn't have his front teeth like his front teeth are gone and in in this on the album in spanish he goes it's the skinny man no tiene diente which means it's the skinny man that doesn't have teeth that's on Parla Isa. So I feel like he wow. has a grill or something, but you never see Misery's front teeth. He kind of, they're missing. So I don't know. It's And he talks about that. And I've noticed he said that in Spanish. So did you notice that? that he doesn't have, didn't have his front teeth? I didn't notice that. And I definitely didn't notice that line because I, I'm not uh, bilingual. So I, like, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more translations from you about his Spanish lyrics, but that's wild. I didn't get all the, I didn't understand all the Spanish, but I picked up certain words that like I listening to it again. I was like, oh, yeah, like he's talking about just a lot of interesting, a lot of stuff like that. Um, I want to talk about Miles Davis and hip hop like the bebop era 
Kind of Blue was a very influential jazz record. I don't know if we've talked about it before, but it really is worth studying because he employs the style called modal jazz. So modal jazz is when you take, you juxtapose a certain scale over a certain chord progression to get a vibe. So for instance, if you play, if you play like a C major scale over an A minor chord progression, you get something that's called the Aeolian mode. So that's a song like um, All Along the Watchtower by dylan covered by hendrix or dio's holy diver you have this kind of like epic vibe right that's a specific example of a mode so parla isla is an example of a modal hip-hop track because you can hear it goes from like minor key the keyboard part dun 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 on the verse to the major key with the horns on the chorus i don't know if that's like a purposeful like jazz recontextualization but that's a you know uh kind of blues a very like new york jazz record and it's interesting how misery's it's very musical Parla Isla is very musical in a very mm -hmm. intentional way. And I think that song is a great example of that. And if you listen to some of Madrox's, the way Madrox layers his lyrics, you know how Madrox sometimes gets this creepy sound where it's like he'll do two vocals. It yep. sounds, you know, that's called the, um, that's called the Locrian mode, the way he layers his vocals. It's this dissonant purposeful juxtaposition of like a C note over like a B minor flatted fifth chord. He has that vibe when he's flowing. And so Word. I, I feel like, yeah, my point is that the artists that were on Psychopathic had this musical knowledge and they did things that ICP kind of hadn't and wouldn't have thought to do. But if you look at it from a musical ear, it's really cool to hear how all this was happening. So I've been studying modes and like writing songs in that way. So it made me think about that these days. Anyway. Hell that's yeah. That's up. super. That's some super fresh music theory knowledge that you're only going to find on Hatchet Chat. Holler. Um, we want to stimulate your dome. What's up with track two? <laughs> For sure. Stimulated dome. Uh, super good song, man. Great beat. Uh, just man, misery's right. I've I've always liked this EP, but listening to it for this uh, for this episode, man, I just I was I, I was so enjoying it. And misery style is so good. You know, uh, this is another one uh, produced by um, uh, the trio of the minority DJP and misery. And yeah, just kind of like I think it's it is a reference to like smoking weed. I think, but it could also just be looked at as an introspective song overall. But he does have some references to weed, so I'm assuming the introspection is probably uh, you know brought on by by smoking weed. But super dope track, and it actually has a uh, pretty uh, big sample in it. Donna Summers on the radio, and just an all around great tune. And I love the uh, piano part, man. It's so dope. That da da da. Yeah. It's so chill. Is that the Donna Summer sample? Uh, well, actually, the Donna Summers is yeah, is like the main like ding 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 ding. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's such a cool. Um, yeah, that's such a beautiful like. Yeah, that song is great. And um, it is. Yeah, misery definitely blazes. It's all good, you know. Blaze if you smoke, <laughs> blaze up. That's what yeah. we always say. Um, stack it up. Violent J at the beginning says Spanish side, and then he goes Berrica like that. So he's saying Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican. That's that's what's up. I think that's the only time I've heard Jay speak Spanish where it's not like in a funny way, where he's actually trying to sound like like bilingual. Um, that's what's up. Um, yeah, he definitely does. He pulls the pronunciation off pretty good, at least to my ears. Yeah, it sounds tight. Spanish side, so Spanish side is Misery's clique, his crew, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a few of them, Fuego Flames and stuff. That's the crew that he rolls with all the way to present day. And I met some of them at the gathering, and I guess when the stuff went down with Twisted on the um, interview, not to get too negative, I remember people were saying like, yo, well, Twisted really has to look out for Spanish side. I was like, what? I thought that just meant because Misery speaks Spanish. I didn't realize it was an actual clique. Yep. So that's what's up. And they're referenced throughout this EP. Yes. Stack it up. So that's a song about street life, uh, yep. stacking money. I mean, it's tight. The beat's tight. I mean, it's another example, though, of like a song that ICP wouldn't just write a song called We Make Money, We Enjoy It, We're right. Drug Dealers, unless they're doing um, Psychopathic Riders. But Misery exactly. is, is a cool. It's a cool track, right? It's a super cool track. And, you know, this is one of the ones produced by Mikey Clark. And it really, really... Uh, you know, makes me just want to hear Misery rap over a bunch more Mikey Clark beats. I just, because he just kills it, dude. And like, Misery's style is so cool when it comes to rapping because it's not like the most technical. And like, when he, you know, the way he places rhymes and stuff, like, I would never think to do it the way he does, but they sound so good, his rhyme schemes and stuff. And I, this is probably uh, my second favorite song on the whole EP. Well, if you listen to like Fat Joe, and he, yeah, Fat Joe's a good example. Like, um, all the way up um 
Even that chorus, nothing can stop me, I'm all the way up. The way that kind of like Latin vibe, Spanish, you know, when we look at English is an interesting language because England was colonized and taken over by Germanic people, Celtic people, the Romans, all these languages got shoved into England. And that's why our, I was talking to my wife about this, why like in Spanish, you don't hear K a lot, you hear C. Right, C begins right. gives a k sound, but that's because we have the influence of, I guess that would be, kind of the Viking Germanic influence on English. Right. Spanish Spanish language has un música bonita, perfecto para oír la lengua es muy muy hermosa. I said it's a beautiful language when you hear it; it sounds beautiful, and it, because it has it's a Romance language, it, it has it's directly related to Latin, and it sounds dope. So when you're d- rapping in Spanish, like. You're able to have a sense of rhythm that doesn't pl- uh, doesn't hit on the necessarily one, two, three, four. Like if you're rapping in English, you have all these um, syllables that have to like sit sit with the syncopation in a certain right. way, so to speak. Spanish, you get this musicality because the language is more free. I I know it's kind of hard to express that without giving examples, but you hear that, that in. Yeah, and a lot of bilingual rappers, even Cypress Hill. I mean, even the Mexican American, most of them. Um, you know, like like I'm trying to think of an example, in, insane in the brain. To the one on the flam, boy, the temper just tossed that man in the frying pan like that. Feel da 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 da. Like yeah. you have that kind of da 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 da. Where Nas will be, where if you listen to like Nas, like a, a rapper that raps in English, I heard Jerome's beat. Jerome's niece got shot in the dome piece coming back from Jones Beach. Da, 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 da. So you have a more I don't know musicality with these bilingual rappers in Spanish. Um, it might be kind of a vague analysis, but you can hear it. It's hard to talk about, but you can definitely hear that. Absolutely. And I think that's what I was noticing. And, and, you know, I didn't even think about that, but it makes so much sense. Like, you know, your, your, the languages that you know are naturally going to have an effect on something like rapping because, you know, it's, it's using words in a rhythmic way. So that's a super dope insight, man. I'm actually glad we talked about that because I just got school. That's what's up. And also, check it out. On uh, on uh, Stack It Up, he does that, the outro. He goes, bounce, 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 yeah. bounce. I, it made me think of stomp, stomp, I had, stomp. Yes. You thought that too? I was that, wondering dude? if you were going to say that. I had the same thought. Ugh. Mind meld, bro. Yeah. That's what's up. And he says, on this song, he says twisted more than once. So right. I'm just saying. Jamie and Paul, may, I'm sure Jamie and Paul heard this, and they may have been like, Err. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever die. So check it out. This song, I always have thought this, um, ever since I heard it, that it's a sample based on, it's the theme from Terminator 2. The James Horner sample. I always thought they sampled it, maybe replayed it, but it's basically the same melody of Terminator 2. When I heard, and it's on, it's also on um, Hatchet History. I mean, it's like one of those songs. It's great. This is Misery's best song. Um, I Yeah, th- this yeah. might be my favorite song. And dude, like, you're talking about the beat the beat is amazing it's like i just i love this beat it reminds me uh not so much the exact melody but the production style uh bushwick's bushwick bills phantom of the opera has a lot of beats similar to this with like these big single uh piano key strokes and like when i heard i I heard this before i heard that album and i was like oh my gosh like this all these uh, most of these beats sound like something that was you know sounds like if i ever died so if anybody likes this beat listen to that album if you haven't uh, because the production style sounds so similar and yeah a masterpiece of a song shout out to bushwick bill a r.i.p like a um a master of og horrorcore like uh, into himself I've not 100%. heard that record, man. I'm going to peep that. I'm going to peep that. Dude, yeah, taste. I'm going to send it. To, I actually meant to send it to you because it reminds you of something just like that. I mean, the theme, that's interesting because it's a fan of the opera, right? It's the idea of taking this scary story and turning it into a rap song. Like Terminator, taking that. It's, it's If you listen, if y'all go and listen to the melody, if you don't know the theme, it's da-da-da-da. It's the first notes. It's the exact same. And I'm sure they, they must have like, I don't know. It has to be. The Very same. likely an to. interpolation. Yeah, of that vibe. Um, let's talk about the Spanish on this song. So he goes, Mi amor, I'm going crazy in la calle. That means my love, I'm going crazy in the streets. Tengo un senti- sentimiento that death is calling me. I have a feeling that death is calling me. Uh, let's go. Word. Una amor chica, one love baby. That means a little love, one love baby. To my little love, don't take it on you, but this world's got me crazy. As we spark this for my fam in the darkness, Boricuas, misery, I'm about to start this. So as as we spark this for my fam and the family, Puerto Ricans, misery, I'm about to start this, right? And then, yeah, that's it. That's it. But those words, 
are espanol yeah man and that that's such a it's just he, he weaves in and out of it really seamlessly that's so impressive you know it's because it's one thing to be bilingual but then to use that in a rap style so fresh and uh one of one of my favorite lines on the album is uh, is on this song and it's like nothing to lose but this misery uh given to me by hereditary and there's a couple of times where he uses his name you know spelt like misery spelt with uh spelt like incorrectly on purpose he uses that you know as a play on words with the actual term misery and you know i'm just wondering was that like a reference to maybe he suffers from de- depression like misery given to me by heredi- her- heredity you know i just thought that was a yeah. really cool play on words that's a dope line and i think it's the um like we've said this before, but the idea, I mean, so much of what they did with Twisted comes from this because it's like, yeah. take a word that means something dark, misery, twisted, and spell it, spell it incorrectly. Um, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, but that, yeah, misery has it and twisted do that too. They say yes. twisted and then it's twisted. And it's, I mean, it's what's up. Like these freaking, the twi- early Twisted Records, the early Misery Records, ICP, Psychopathic's OG 90s rap that goes back to what we're talking about. It's this amazing alternative to the Jiggy stuff that was like, yo, these, like people clowned on Jay and Shaggy for not being the best lyricists. I feel like that may or may not be merited. They're so original and like they have style. On Dark Lotus, you'll hear like the first Dark Lotus, especially the, the skill of Madrox compared to like Jay. You know right. what I'm saying? But like they sign the coolest stuff and they put their mark on yeah. it. A, a song that's particularly shows this is Witching Hour. Let's get into this because right. this is a this is a classic. This is a yeah. great song, right? Absolutely. A hundred percent, man. You know, uh, like you, I think it was the first song that I heard with Misery on it because it is on the uh, it's the last track, I believe, on disc one of the Forgotten Freshness volume one and two re-release. And it's produced by Mikey Clark. Got an amazing ICP uh, feature, uh, you know, the witching hour is a term familiar to Juggalos. Uh, I think ICP have used it a couple times, and um, uh, Violent J even had his radio show on WFF Radio was called The Witching Hour with Violent J. And if you <clears throat> read about, like, the concept of the witching hour, it, you know, has a lot of uh, supernatural connotations, like, of various kinds, like, you know, uh, it could mean that, like, that's the hour in the middle of the night around 3 o'clock where, like, supernatural activity is higher, uh, and things like that, uh, but in this song, it pretty much seems to mean like your 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 time to leave this earth, like death. Is that what you got from it? Yes, I mean you you hit the nail on the head, snacks, because it's like the mooching hour, which has a specific time in the middle of the night, but also the practicality of what happens when you die, and then that's right. taking the two styles, the the, the spooky, like kind of. Um, Spookiness of ICP with the practicality of like a gangster getting taken out like with misery. And that's why it's so interesting. Um, it's morbid and it's like how life carries on without without us. And like like you said, and, and Jay uses this really cool literary technique called anaphora through this. So anaphora is when you repeat something for emphasis. Time for your girlfriend to stick the duh, duh. Time for the duh. We're so he, time for, he's telling you what it's time for. It's the witching right. hour. See, the anaphora is a is an example of that. And it's, it's, it's cool because misery does not use it. He's just kind of rhyming about what happens yeah. when you die. But Jay hits this home. And I think something really, really cool is a, the framing device of this lyrical, of Jay's verse, because he ends with how he starts it as an outro. And I, I, I haven't heard that a lot where like they'll take a like a representational literary introduction and use it as the outro because it kind of reinforces the point that death is final and I think that's like beautifully written and it's like yeah I remember when I first heard this it kind of, I was tripping on it because I was in high school and it was the first time I like had a first time I had a girlfriend, like the first time I was making music and I was thinking about like just immortality and how you feel like when you're young, you're gone forever. And some of the graphic lines about what happens, like, especially what happens when you leave your girlfriend, if you die, you know, she's going to move on. And like, it's creepy, but it's also, it's like real. It's like a seized carpe diem kind of vibe too. Because that's you only right. Have one, right. And, and man, yeah. that's such a good analysis. And it's interesting to me too, because a lot of times like, uh, ICP, you know, psychopathic records, but specifically ICP will like leave, you know, end albums on like a light spiritual note, you know what I mean? But this mm. is like ending an album on a morbid take of death. It doesn't really talk so much about what happens to you in the afterlife, but it, it's a cynical take, like you said, about life moving on around you after you die. 
and you know it's it's such a, a morbid uh, you know it's a horror masterpiece in that sense because like it, all of the it's it's all of the bad stuff in death you know none of the good stuff and everybody's kind of afraid of death so it just plays on on that uh, that fair and yeah a great tune and I think it's also kind of a microcosm of how even though misery has his own style and in a way sticks out from the rest of psychopathic it can still fit in and mesh you know what i mean because like you mm. said i see you know violent jay's verse is framed in a certain way misery is just kind of rapping but it still works you know what i mean and that's kind of a microcosm of this ep in my opinion yeah it's like uh that's true man it's a great example of why the ep is so tight something musically about it I, I don't know if you noticed this during the misery's verse the music's different like it's a there's a sound of an airplane flying by right and i always thought about like the movement the motion I, do, you, yeah. do you remember every time and every time i used to hear airplanes it would you know how like you hear a sound on a record and it mm -hmm. triggers a memory like when i used yep. to hear an air conditioning turn on it reminded me of the feedback at the beginning of marilyn manson's a beautiful people beautiful Absolutely. people like you hear a so i'd hear an airplane and i'd fly by like and i think of misery's verse yep i don't know you feel Absol me right yeah yeah i feel you dude man yeah just a, a great song it, like yeah what a, what a masterpiece psychopathic classic and legs diamond plays the doctor doing the uh tr we're losing him we're losing right. him right did yep. you mention that maybe you did I don't think I even put that in my notes. I don't even think I wrote that down, but that is true. And that's a super fresh appearance from Legs Dime. We can't get enough of Legs, so we're happy whenever we hear him. <laughs> we, um, also, the beat has the heartbeat, the monitor yep. as part of the beat. We've heard that on other songs, haven't we? This yeah, is not absolutely. the first time. What no. other songs do you remember? Well, the main thing that comes to my mind is, uh, uh, you know, the intro of Hell's Pit, but also Wizard of the Hood has that, like, you know that eight beat like throughout i pretty i pretty much i'm pretty sure it's on every song but one uh just mm. constantly no matter what that tempo it's still on the same uh upbeat kind of thing throughout the whole album that's tight um the imagery of maggots crawl consuming your flesh i mean that would become a primary uh lyrical trope of blaze your dead homie i got a maggot face and i don't care yep. maggots crawl and then rock the dead maggots crawling up my face that's what i said throw your the hands up and rock the dead like maggots that's a um what what what, what would a maggot be um a trochee maggots Duh! it's a great lyrical it's, it hits hard so they use that a yep. lot in, their, in horror core and so you hear it here yes so, yeah Maggie. Absolutely, and like uh, anyway. it makes you think of something you know that you're usually repulsed to to uh, repulsed from as well. So it gives that extra emphasis. That's what's up. It ends with Parla Isla instrumental, but it's really not instrumental because you hear the quieted vocals in the background, and you hear on the chorus, you hear the the chorus. So this is this was his what they call a TV track, which is what you perform to on stage. Obviously, that's what right. they just put at the end. It's not his yeah, story. I was like, oh, yo, I could rap on this. Like, no, you could hear his voice. Like, I was kind of disappointed by that. It's weird. For sure. No I've disrespect. always thought it was interesting. No disrespect, interesting. Nene. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, we love you, Misery. The CP's fresh. Uh, but yeah, I, I've always kind of wondered the same thing. Like, if they just kind of wanted to... Like, I, I don't really know why the instrumental is on there. It's a great beat. Maybe they just wanted to show it off again. <laughs> it is a great beat. No, I mean, it reflects his... It's it's the It's the... Puerto Rican musical culture, you know, I mean, it's a cool beat on its own. You can kind of hear the tonal stuff, the modal stuff I'm talking That's about. That's right. Let's talk about the Spanish at the end of Witching Hour. So at the end, we just listened and did a piece by piece uh, breakdown. He's basically saying, for my people forever, when you hear me, when you hear me scream, I'm on the throne, I've been here forever, and Puerto Rico for the island. I mean, that's what he's saying over the outro of Misery. We could do a line by line analysis, but that's basically what he's saying. And I didn't catch all of it, but like, I got enough so we know that's what he's what's that's the flavor he brings in his last outro absolutely he's flexing he's letting them know in spanish <laughs> and now we're letting you know <laughs> in english we're... that's right <laughs> <laughs> um all right so let's talk about the aftermath of misery's parla isla so uh was he in big money hustlers snacks let's talk he, about that he was indeed he was uh, he played a character named green willie you know one of the uh, criminals that uh, was basically you know recruited by uh, big baby sweets and uh, yeah he, he, he was like i guess like a, a fake jewelry salesman green because of like the uh, you know the color that uh, a fake gold can leave and he misery's character green willie is all decked up in, in gold and stuff uh, so that's a fresh little cameo uh, in big money hustlers that's hilarious. Um, yeah, and then so what happened? So misery. Why did misery fall out with psychopathic? 
Well, you know, we've heard different things uh, over the over the years about that, and uh, you know, in in um, behind the paint, it doesn't really go into details. Uh, but we happen to find an interview by Violent J. You know, maybe we can link to in the description uh, where he kind of goes more detail. Uh, goes into more detail about Misery, and you had alluded to it at the beginning of uh, this episode where Misery kind of felt like he might be better in front of a traditional hip-hop audience and kind of didn't know if the, the Juggalo world was the, the best place for his music. Um, but uh, it's all good, though, because like you said, there's a family connection, and to this day, you know, Misery got nothing but Juggalo love, and as we mentioned, there's a 20th anniversary edition of um, Parala Isla, on uh, on Psychopath that came out in 2018 and it came with the new album Demon Angel which was announced years before it was finally released uh, a couple of years back so uh, that's fresh and Misery even has his own card in Into the Echo Side so this is what Jay said about uh, Misery and how and his parting with the label Misery is a rapper that my brother brought to Psychopathic my brother has a family in the Bronx and that's how he met Nene I had always I always had the feeling that Misery thought our music was whack. It seemed like he wanted to get his break, so he hung out. It seemed like he thought the Dark Carnival was a joke. Then I got to know him more and more, and that feeling went away. He never truly believed in it, though. I even showed him the Dark Carnival's magic in our studio, and he thought it was a trick. I only show my friends, my best friends that's, that S2. He's a cool mother, hmm, too. He gets mad skins, blah, 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 blah. See, Psychopathic is into some bizarre stuff, and it has that reputation. Misery is more into New York raps. Even though the stuff we say is our reality, it ain't theirs. They come from another place, and they are just a different, different stuff than us. They tour with us twice. Anyway, he's basically saying, my brother's really close to his family. I wish him and Pancho mad luck out there. So that's what Jay said, and that's on the Misery site, which is like this kind of old tripod site that Misery put together, the official temporary Misery site. So don't you feel like the Demon Angel... Like, what... <sighs> If I were to like wait 20 years to put out a record, I wouldn't put my second record as a second disc on the re-release. Because, I mean, I already have Parla Isla, so I'm not going to buy the 20th anniversary necessarily. I would have bought the Demon Angel, though, on its own, but I don't want to drop $30 on a album I already have. I don't know. It's an interesting move, but maybe he thought the nostalgia would help sell the new record that he worked on forever. What do you That's think? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a, a big promotional aspect of this album uh, was that it, it was the LP. It was the Parala Isla LP that was supposed to come out um, uh, after the, the EP. And it had tracks that were recorded back then. It wasn't ah. like, yeah, that were, they were kind of in the vault. So like you, you'll actually hear songs that were recorded around the time of Parala Isla uh, that, didn't, that, that we didn't hear because we didn't get that LP on Psychopathic. But it, it's, it's, it's enhanced... I think as far as mastering, but there was no additional recording work done. So I guess, like you said, uh, that mixed with the nostalgia for Parallel Isla. Like I didn't have a copy of Parallel Isla too, so like this was a way to get that in the new album and stuff because I've only heard it online. Uh, but I know what you mean, though. It's almost like oh, you got this new album hyped up for a while. You'd want to release it separately. Yeah, when I when I asked, when I said hi to Misery and and what, at the gathering, he was like, "Yo, have you heard the twentieth anniversary?" And I was like, no, I haven't. And it was confusing what it even was. But now I get it. Okay. And um, I think that's what's yeah. up. So go peep that. If y'all like this episode, I want to also say I talked a lot about Puerto Rican influence in Brooklyn. But but Misery's from the Bronx. And that's where hip hop was born. So in yeah. a way, he's like very close and true to the culture. He must have, as a kid, seen break dancers and DJing in the park. He may have been there when Herc played the first concert at 1520 Sedgwick, the first hip hop show which is yeah. now, it's interesting, man. It's coming up on, pretty soon will be the 50th anniversary of that first hip-hop wow. show. F hip-hop is almost 50 years old. That's nuts. Yeah, that's amazing, dude. Here's well, 50 more years, 50,000 more years. Um, that's what's up, 50,000 50, more years. Uh, this Saturday, I'm doing the Boxing Day show with the Mount Nerdcore homies, Schaefer, Frontalot, Mega Ran, and Shubzill and Bill Beat, so you can get tickets for that. Um, if, if you su support my Patreon on the 30th, my man MC Snacks is opening the show, so that's what's up. So he's going to be doing a little set on our live stream, and you can you can chat with us during the concert. Um, so that's going to be on New Year's Eve Eve, and uh, this is our last episode of the year. So good work, mm -hmm. Snacks. You really worked hard all year on making this happen, producing you this flavor. You too, buddy. You too, man. This has been an absolute pleasure, and I can't wait to keep uh, being a part of this in the new year. We got lots more flavor on the horizon.
We'll be back in the new year with Forgotten Freshness 1 and 2. And uh, I'm trying to get a special guest lined up for that. So we'll talk more. You'll see. But that's coming up. That will, be, that will be right after, right in the new year. So stay tuned. Subscribe. Spread the word. And, uh, yo, shout out to Rude Boy. Thanks for being on this episode. That was Ty Zach. Thank you, Rude Boy. That was an absolute honor. You're the man. We love you. We do love you. And we'll uh, see you all next year. Peace. Oh my gosh. Peace, y'all. Much cloud love. Oh, yeah. Whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. <laughs>